And joining us now, Dr. David Sackett. He is the founder of North America's first epidemiology department at McMaster University in Hamilton and the winner of the Gardner Award for Outstanding Leadership in Medicine. Welcome to TVO and congratulations. Thanks very much. Well, you know the Gardners, they call them the baby Nobels. This is a big deal, so I want to first find out, how'd you get the news? Golly, um, I think I had a phone call from John Dirks, who's one of the senior folks there, uh, with the news. He and I have known each other for years and years and years. And uh, it was a delight to hear him. I wasn't quite sure what he was on the phone about. And then he dropped the bomb. And what'd you think? Uh, well, we lived in Britain for several years, and the term there would be gobsmacked, <laughs> that uh, I was speechless for a bit. Speechless? Sure. I've only known you for a few <laughs> minutes here. That sounds like a condition that you don't have happen too often. Yes, that's right. It only, usually only occurs under anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's go through some of the very basic terms of, of what you do that got you this award uh, that may be very familiar to you, but probably are not so familiar to our viewers. So you got it for your work in clinical epidemiology. Yes. What is that? Clinical epidemiology is taking the disciplines, the methodologies that have been developed in public health, epidemiology and biostatistics, that were responsible for things like demonstrating that the Salk polio vaccine was effective or that tuberculosis screening was effective, and turning those into paying attention to individual patients. So it's taking those public health disciplines and making them part of clinical medicine. And the other piece of this, I gather, is that you're being acknowledged for your work on evidence-based medicine. Yes. What's, what is that term? That is a natural outgrowth of clinical epidemiology that has three elements. The first and most important is the patient. Uh, what is their problem? How do they see their problem? What are their expectations? What do they want to get out of the transaction? The second is your own clinical skills. You've got to be a good doctor. You have to be very good at diagnostics uh, and sorting out exactly what's going on. And then the third would be the evidence that you draw upon to make decisions about that patient's therapy. And putting all those three together uh, is what we call evidence-based medicine. If there's an evidence-based approach, I presume there is another based approach. What else could there be? Well, in, in medical history, those sorts of decisions have usually been based on simply observing patients. Who did well, who didn't go do well, and what did they receive? And the problem with those sorts of observations is that if a patient's going to die, you can give them a lethal treatment and you'll never notice. <laughs> if a patient's going to get better, uh, you can give them any sort of treatment and the treatment will look effective. So that we had situations such as poor old George Washington. This is a great story. Yes, go uh, ahead, tell this one. George was a very healthy, robust 68-year-old guy who was out riding his horse around his plantation, came home, got a sore throat. And it fairly rapidly developed into something uh, called epiglottitis, that little flap in the back of our throats that closes over our windpipes when we, when we uh, swallow. And that flap swelled up uh, on, on George. Fancy name is epiglottitis. And the question is, how do you treat that? Well, the way you treat it if it gets bad is to make a small opening in the trachea below then, a so-called tracheostomy. Would they have done that in his day? Tracheostomy has been done for millennia. Really? Okay. Uh, Homer describes uh, Alexander the Great doing a tracheotomy on the battlefield on a severely uh, uh, hurt warrior. And so these very smart doctors who were called in to see George knew about his diagnosis, knew how to do tracheostomy, but instead of that, they followed the treatment that was suggested by the authorities of the day, uh, the so-called experts, who were very, very bright people but had developed their ideas about what worked simply by observing folks. Rather than based on evidence. There, was, there were no trials, there were no experiments going on in, in that era. And so the expert treatment was bloodletting. So they bled him. They bled poor old George for, a guy George's age and size would probably have about 12 pints of blood in his system. They took eight of them away in nine hours. And, and, of course, when George died quietly at the end of all that, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. They said we did everything we could, but even, yes. our, even our best wisdom wouldn't that's work. Right. That's right. That's right. Now, th th but, okay, that's a, a, an example that's, I don't know, what, 150 years old or something sure. like that. Mm -hmm. We don't still do that today. I'm not talking about bloodletting in particular, but we don't take that kind of approach to medicine today, do we, where we say, 
you know, it doesn't matter what the evidence suggests, here's what I've always done and that's what we're going to do. Well, it's not so much that it's done contrary to the evidence as it is it's done in the absence of evidence. Uh -huh. So that an enormous amount of what we're able to provide patients these days is indeed based on solid evidence, but we still have occasions, frequently tragic ones, in which a treatment which has been provided for years and years and years is put to the test and is found to be damaging. The most dramatic one of those here in North America was the way we used to treat patients. They'd had a heart attack. After their heart attack, their heart rhythm was unstable. We were concerned because that was kind of a predictor that they were going to die in the next 24 months. We had drugs that would normalize that rhythm and simply make it nice and smooth. And as a result of that observation, uh, we decided we ought to treat all those folks with those drugs. They'd been in use for quite some time before a randomized trial was carried out in which patients with that abnormal rhythm were assigned by a system analogous to flipping a coin to receive or not receive these drugs. They had to stop that trial in an emergency because they discovered that for every 20 patients they treated that way, they killed one. <laughs> and the calculation was made in the United States that more patients had been killed by those drugs than had been killed by the Viet Cong. Oh my goodness. My assumption though is that, you tell me if I'm wrong here, what you're suggesting probably flies in the face of a lot of common procedure and therefore hasn't won you many friends in the healthcare system. Is that fair to say? Um, I guess we'd have to separate that into the old guys and the young guys. Okay. Uh, the young guys seized on this very, very quickly because perhaps they were more curious they were more open to new ideas. Uh, and of course, they tended to uh, have their sorts of difficulties with the old senior establishment. Uh, this was particularly marked in, in England, uh, where when I first took on a clinical service in Oxford, my chief resident uh, was older than I had been when I took my first chair here mm -hmm. in Canada. And to be able to arm those young folks with a way of testing uh, politely, <laughs> but testing and challenging their seniors as to whether or not the diagnostic test they ordered really was worth doing, whether the treatment they were going to suggest really did more good than harm. Hmm. And so the young folks tended to grasp it very, very quickly. And then more and more of the older generation did as well. Some of the real pioneers, of course, had, had been doing this for quite some time. But that uh, some of the senior professors, particularly in England, uh, did, did not like it very much because it meant that a young upstart medical student could tell them off. I can understand that. What about some of these other new ideas like web-based self-diagnostic mm. things, WebMD, that kind of thing? Are you, what's I'm, your view on that? I'm not particularly familiar with them. There, there of course, are huge amounts of websites. I did a, uh, I did a Google the other day before uh, coming over and there, if you put in Google for evidence-based now, you will get 60 million hits. Hmm. So that they're all over the place. Uh, the ones that I know most about are ones developed by groups such as Brian Haynes and his team at McMaster, where they go through the world literature, they test it to see, is this clinical article likely to be true? And if true, is it likely to be clinically important? When they put that screen on the clinical journals, they discover that 98% of it either ain't true or ain't useful. And they take then that remaining 2% and put it in various formats, journals, journal supplements, on the web, of various kinds of, of, of circumstances in which folks can get at that better evidence. Gotcha. You mentioned McMaster, so let me pick up on that. Yes. You were there at the beginning of the epidemiology yes. department at Mac, the first yes. one ever in North America. It was the first clinical epidemiology department. Yeah. And we're talking, what is this, 1960? 1967. Seven? Take us back to those days. First of all, why, why uh, I'm from Hamilton, so you will not <laughs> misinterpret <laughs> yep. the, the meaning behind this yep. question, but why would the first leading edge of anything be in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada at that time? Um, I guess you can say people, 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 rather than location, location, location. There were simply an astonishing group of folks who, who came there. John Evans, uh, the, the then president, Harry Thode, uh, Arthur Borns, who was a vice president, who did all the groundwork. Uh, just a, such a remarkable group of folks that 
when I came up for my interview uh, from the States, I didn't want to come to Canada, certainly didn't want to come to Hamilton. Um, when I met these folks and started talking with them, they were just so exciting, uh, so forward-looking. Um, for example, they asked me, what sort of Department of Social Community and Preventive Medicine should we have at this new medical school? And I said, none. <laughs> that unless the surgeons and the pediatricians and the psychiatrists are concerned about social, community, and preventive medicine, you can never have a department big enough to make any difference. They then said, well, OK, what sort of course should we have in epidemiology and biostatistics for our medical students? And I said, none. That unless it's integrated with clinical skills, clinical pharmacology, diagnostics, that sort of thing, it would be just as awful as it is every place else. Well, they had already been bringing in folks like Elvin Zapersky and Nate Epstein, who were putting their faculty out in the town, not in the ivory tower. They already had brought in the brilliant man named Bill Spaulding from Toronto, who had begun to design a curriculum that had no courses in epidemiology and biostatistics or anything else. That they, of course, had come up with the problem-based learning program. So that they mistook a, a novice like me for a sage and, and uh, offered me this incredible opportunity. Now, you're from Illinois originally, right? Yes. How long, well, I should ask you, do you feel thoroughly Canadian today? Oh, sure. How long did that take? Uh, three months. Three months after moving to Hamilton? Yes. yes. You felt thoroughly yeah. Canadian? Yep, yep. And, and it was uh, perhaps best exemplified by when we moved to this small town of Ancaster, um, up on the mountain above Hamilton. And we went down to sign up for things, uh, you know, garbage and that sort of stuff. And this very nice woman uh, behind the counter said, this form I have to fill out is very long and very complex, but I know about it, and you don't. Can I just sort of interview you and, and fill in the blanks? And so we went through it all, and she got to the end of it, and she said, and what's your religion? And we said, oh, golly, ma'am. I mean, you know, we've just moved to your country. We don't want to get off on the wrong foot, but we don't think our religion is any of your business. And she said, oh, you must be a yank. <laughs> because what she was interested yeah. in was where we wanted our school tax to go. Oh, of course. And yeah. the easiest way to do that is to ask religion, and no Canadian would object to that sort of question. Um, so that the difference between the countries was not really very great. Uh, the huge difference, of course, was in health care. Uh, and my work in, in the United States had always been in the slums of Chicago and Buffalo and Boston, uh, where my patients there were just so much up against it. Uh, you know, they couldn't afford medications, they couldn't afford diagnostic tests, they certainly couldn't afford to come into hospital, so that I never felt I could send a bill when I was down there. And to move from that system to the system up here where universal health care was coming in and where the dramatic, dramatic social programs uh, were being developed, uh, just made me feel so much more at home here uh, than I did down there. I should ask you one last thing, and that is, um, it's an odd question to ask because people don't want to think that they've stopped contributing, and you haven't stopped contributing, but you know, when you win an award like this, you start thinking about your legacy. So what do you think your legacy is to this country, to healthcare, to your work? Uh, gee, young people. Um, they, they are both my legacy and, of course, responsible for my getting this award. Because one of the marvelous things that happened at McMaster is that we attracted simply brilliant, brilliant young folks who came through our school, who came through our graduate programs, who are now my colleagues and my mentors uh, at, at uh, McMaster. And so it's going to be people and, and the marvelous, marvelous things that they're doing, extending what I started far beyond my wildest dreams. Dr. David Sackett, winner of the Gardner Award for Outstanding Leadership in Medicine. You are quite some pioneer, sir, and thank you for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you.